So Sarah, thanks for coming today to talk to me. That's, it's great to be here, thank you. So we're going to talk about the work that I made as part of the, we began as part of the body project, which started obviously when I was doing the artist in residence at your lab in 2017, wow. which was organised by ASCUS Art and Science. So can we start off by you explain a little bit more, well, a bit about your research? Yeah, so my research uh, focuses on this skin disease, uh, eczema, that's an itchy skin disease that affects many, many people. And it ranges in severity, as you know, from something really quite mild to, to a disease that can change somebody's life. Um, and the approach I take is trying to understand the genetic mechanisms that control how your skin's made and make you more or less likely to get skin inflammation. And as you know, we use skin cells in the lab. So these are, these are cells from, uh, from human tissue um, that we culture to make artificial skin so that we can really you know, change what's happening inside the cells to really get to the root cause of how the DNA controls how the skin uh, is made and how it functions. So it's very human research, you know, it's human tissue that we're using and it's a very human condition. Um, so I'd always been keen to explain that to people, to, to help people understand what skin is about and why my research is important. Um, but I thought, you know, it, often people are not allowed to come into the lab. So I was looking for ways that um, somehow we might be able to explain or reveal the lab in new ways to people outside. And inviting an artist in seemed a great opportunity. So how did you find it? Like, how did you get started? Or tell me about how it felt when you started in the lab and what approach you took. Well, I found it fascinating and it sort of adds to what, because you were already working with public in some ways through science public engagement, weren't you, anyway as well? And I am interested in that as a way that I work that sort of adds to science public engagement quite sort of specifically, but in different ways from you might have done it before. And it was a fascinating environment. I mean, for me, that first, because it was about six months that I was there, one or two days a week, wasn't it? And um, so what I found was really, really useful was the way that then you allowed me to observe what was happening. And it was very, it was a huge generosity of just letting me be in the space. So I worked quite closely with Sheila, your technician as well, and sort of been working really observing the processes, so actually practically, but there was also lots of more sort of philosophical and ethical conversations. And then it was also coming to the seminars that you did, so the ones that you would do that were either your own, or then also sometimes having people from other labs and then inviting me to talk as well, which was really lovely as a sort of exchange that was happening. So it was, and then what I think was building through this, so that's quite typical of how I'd work where I'd go into a situation and observe first of all. And then the thing that I really sort of started to attach to was the artificial skin itself, the organotypic, or you call it organoid, organoid as you well. You can call it either, yeah. Yeah, so that in itself, <laughs> I was really fascinated about the way that the, the level of care and attention that was extraordinary that goes into it and the precariousness of this three week long life cycle from theatre to the lab to then disposal. Mm. But then also the way that you would all talk about it as well in terms of there was really, I was really fascinated. And there was also the, just the point that actually it's human tissue but it's outside of the body in vitro. Is that the right term? Yeah, yeah. in vitro. In vitro, and in um, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's and the whole idea that then it's human, but and living, but no longer within the body. So it's it's in this sort of paradoxical situation. And is that kind of what you expected? I mean, did you? How much of that did you know before you went in the lab, and how much was a surprise? Well, I think I was a surprise, but it's what I'm interested in anyway, because I'm yeah. interested in the relationship between the body and science and technology, mm -hmm. and what the sort of expansion of these things adds and shifts in our perception of what it means to be human, what it means to our lived experience. But what I was surprised about, he was like, the, the lived experience that I focused in on was actually the cells, not so much. I mean, I was really interested in the staff as well, but I focused on that as this other version of human that was mm -hmm. happening in the, in the lab. And what I was really curious about as well, so it's the process of analysis that you were using and all these very, very detailed processes. Um, but then also the way that you all spoke about it, because you used phrases like whether the cells were happy, didn't you? I mean, that's quite a common way, isn't it? Yeah, you... yeah, yeah, we, we talk about the cells. I mean, they are a living thing, so you do need to keep them happy, just like you would a baby or, um, you know, any, any living creature. You have to give them what they need and, and make sure you take away what they don't, what, you know, what can harm them. 
And it was that fragility of that process, but the care and attention that was going on from temperature, from feeding, from everything, all those layers that was mm -hmm. fascinating. And that's where, and it was actually through the talking that I was actually, you know, doing talking to you all a lot. And that's where I decided to actually then interview. It was three of you that I interviewed on the, on the process and the journey of the cells mm -hmm. from the theatre to the lab. And theatre, when we mean, we mean like a medical theatre, as an operating theatre. Theatre yeah. to the lab and then to disposal. And then what I did was crafted that into a script, which was then... And, but then what I did was I took that information and wrote it from the point of view of the skin cells because I was interested in their experience. So it was shifting. So, so, and what I did, if you remember, I checked with you quite thoroughly about the script as well because I wanted that it was 100% scientifically yeah accurate yeah. that the whole thing is accurate but also had this more emotive feel to it through the descriptive phrases that you used and that's where your skill comes in because obviously I can write things that are scientifically accurate but taking that different perspective or expressing it from the perspective of the cell was not something that we'd ever thought about really well and it's not what would typically be pub would be published yeah, in your no. way is it in your world so that's what I, yeah i was very interested in that as a as a, and very much the sort of work that i'm interested as well in terms of that emotive how you can bring emotive to science and technology and bring different ways for people to understand mm. what's happening but and think about the ethical and practical and philosophical um, issues around those situations so then was then if you remember I used the the speech synthesis voice Heather which is the only Scottish speech yeah, yeah, synthesis yeah, voice cool. to then sort of bring the script to life uh -huh. which is a, then become a key element of the exhibition here because that that's a key part of the soundtrack for both the film and the AR the augmented reality app mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then, then I think following that it was also then working quite closely with yourself and other staff about um, actually to create these, yeah. the 3D printed skin cells. Mm -hmm. So these were you'd very kindly given, allowed me to use a sort of extra of your um, cultures, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then do you want to talk a little bit about that process? Because what I used was it was confocal microscopy, microscopy wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And do you want to talk a little bit about that process, how it fits in with the lab? Sure. So we grow skin cells all the time in the lab. Um, like I said, you know, we, we use um, keratinocytes, the cells are called, extracted from real human tissue. And obviously we have consent from patients uh, that kindly donate their skin when they're having surgical procedures where skin might be removed and it would otherwise be thrown in the bucket. They get, with, with their approval, and their, um, and their consent, they allow that skin instead to be brought to the research lab. So then we can extract the cells. We culture them um, in, 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 a, in a pink liquid that allows the cells to grow. And keratinocytes, the skin cells, always want to kind of join together, settle down and form layers, because this is how the skin's made. The cells very much join together and then grow up into layers. Um, so the tissues that we gave you were exactly that, skin cells that had been allowed to settle down onto a surface and then start to form layers. And it was Martina that helped. She, she labelled the cells with antibodies that, um, that, that are uh, specific proteins that attach to another specific protein. So we all know, you know antibodies react against infection, but in the lab we use antibodies to react against a special part of a cell. So you can tell the antibody to, to, you can design an antibody that binds, that sticks to either the centre of the cell, the nucleus, that's what these are, or um, the skeleton of the cell, kind of literally the, 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 the structure of the cell to show the shape, and that's what these are. And the antibodies are proteins that have a fluorescent tag on them. So then when we shine light on the fluorescent tag, you can see where the protein is bound. And most, most times we, you know, most microscopy that you see is, is two-dimensional. But we can make three-dimensional images using what's called confocal microscopy, because that's a technique where it focuses at a specific layer in the, in the tissue. So not just looking, not just cutting through one section, but focusing at different layers and then using those images to, to reconstruct a three-dimensional shape. And uh, that, so that's what you were able to do with the skin cells specially labelled to show different parts of the cells and then the confocal microscopy to layer it up to make a 3D image. And I know it was Paul Paul that helped you with that, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was Paul Appleton, because for me as well, what was really interesting was it was like a bridge, working with the confocal microscopy, it was a bridge from early 
um, research that I'd done when I'd first come in, where I'd gone into like the collections as well at the University of Dundee, and it was there was some stereoscopic imagery in there as well, which was that classic of oh, yeah. that actually had, I mean that you could only really use within a stereoscope now, but had been used previously as teaching aids that would be projected as three dimensional imagery, and that I was really interested in that alongside. There was 2D illustrations, which would be more the classical things, and then things such as this 3D model, which is then from your office, isn't it? Which you very kindly <laughs> loaned us to put into the exhibition. But then for me, the confocal seemed to sort of add this, literally like another dimension and possibility to how to look in more precise ways at that, whereas a lot of the stuff that I'd been looking in the um, collection seemed to be seen more homogenous. Whereas actually with the confocal, you could really see the sort of individual nature of the cells very clearly. And it was, so then it was working with Paul Appleton in the imaging facility to then try and find a way, because it wasn't a typically used way, although they had these slices and they would build into a 3D shape potentially digitally. It wasn't something that was typically done where that was actually taken out into sort of a CAD type file which actually as Paul and I worked on it we did then find there was something was released that basically did it right at the end of the oh. process after we'd gone through it lots and lots doing a pipeline of yeah. but it was but it was a really interesting process of trying to take that three-dimensional data from the confocal microscope and actually then take that into a CAD style software that would then 3D print it and that's the results here. So Bev it's a classic example of an artist <laughs> asking difficult questions which you did repeatedly I don't know if I've ever told you this but I asked Martina to remind me about the uh, the green labelling and we were both reminiscing about the, the questions that you came to us with how can we do this kind of look at the cells in this way and we were constantly tearing our hair out trying to trying to understand the artist and give you what you needed because yeah the way we use confocal it does make 3d images but we tend to use it to understand the 3d structure by looking at it in different layers rather than putting them all back together so you're absolutely right the cad file that's what we had to extract yeah yeah so that was the different way and then the sizing as well was that these are actually 2,000 times larger than life because yeah. obviously in microscopy you're looking at them on sure. a larger scale isn't it but and i think it was you don't get a feel for it no and it's, so. it was to try and give them that um handheld physical relativity so that people can see that they're obviously clearly magnified and it's part of the exhibit that it will say it's 2,000 times larger than life but that also people get an understanding and I think what and we had some really interesting conversations about this as well about what how then I display in them which is because I mean I was really struck as well from what I the my sort of way more limited knowledge of scientific illustration but how homogenous things normally would seem and then how individual yeah. and really understanding that the cells are individual in themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but then there's also they're going through differentiation as well which is what I've tried to in the larger exhibit when that's on it'll show in the process that that's done as a horizontal way but can you explain so yeah I mean you can see so these as I say the green stain stains the whole shape of the cell because it's like the skeleton that gives the, the cell its, its 3D structure and you can see just by looking at them the very different shapes. So the reason for this is ker keratinocytes or skin cells at the base of the, at the deepest level of skin start off being, being quite plump and round. Um, and then as they divide and move up through your skin to the outermost layer, you can see they get flatter until the very surface cells are really quite flat. So these would be quite close to the, to the outermost layer of the skin. And then even after this, in, when we develop the, the full skin model, even after this layer, the, the cells get even flatter again and then they can shed off the skin surface in real life. Um, so that's why they don't look the same, it's because they're going through different stages of development or different stages of differentiation. The nuclei, so this, this would be what has, controls the, the cell, has the DNA inside it, the nucleus of the cell would be deep inside. Um, and again, even the nuclei are different shapes. Some of this is an artifact, the way you're you know, really just seeing it um, in one uh, second, uh, with split second of time. Um, but the nuclei do vary in size and shape. And as the cells reach the skin surface, the nuclei are destroyed and lost. Um, so yeah, for, for me, as, you know, I spend my life studying skin cells, but to see them as a 3D object, you do see them in a different way. And it's quite nice that it's 2,000 times life size. It's, uh, it's pretty... 
pretty mind-blowing. And you have a set that you use now, don't you, in yeah, science yeah. public engagement as well, which was a really lovely sort of loop that that made as well, that it's actually been used in both, it's both been used in exhibitions, but it's also been used within science public engagement as an extension of the lab's work. It's, it's a great way to talk to people about skin cells, to say here they are. <laughs> yeah. And then as a follow-on from that, then I was interested really, because I found the, the whole sort of situation so fascinating that I really thought about that early sort of parts of it as initial research objects and then I was interested to continue it as then we sort of kept that conversation although I wasn't working in the lab so much specifically at that stage it was we were still in touch weren't we about actually continuing the work and what I was interested was really to add which is very much part of the featuring in the exhibition at Summer Hall is to add ways to bring an audience into the lab but in ways that were not necessarily about a sort of didactic, instructional, informational mm. way, but that sort of trying to enable people to think about those more sort of poetic, ethical questions that the lab raises, because it's very complex what's happening in the lab, in both practically and in terms of those sort of ethical, scientific questions that are happening. And um, yeah, so I was so really the extension there and it was very much thinking about the fact that people can't really as you've said already at the beginning it's very difficult to bring people in isn't it I mean what's the I mean just to say the practical considerations yeah I mean there's all health and safety obviously there's a lot of uh, dangers within a lab space that you can't just allow people to walk through uh, the equipment that we use the potential risk for infection so dangers to anybody passing through the lab but also obviously dangers for the equipment that's in the lab we have a lot of very expensive very sensitive equipment so yeah, we, we rarely invite people into the lab. Even when we do open doors days, you know, it's still only a very limited number of people that are allowed to just walk through the lab space supervised. Um, so, yeah, to, you were really in a privileged position to be allowed um, pretty much free reign to come and go and chat to people. Obviously, uh, you know, re recognising health and safety and you were very good at not fiddling with stuff. <laughs> Bev didn't break anything. <laughs> it is even but, infection as, as, as the actual cultures themselves, exactly, isn't it? But not yeah. only for <clears throat> us to potentially get something, but us to potentially infect the cultures. And that, yeah. I think, was really sort of how, again, to the fragility of yep. themselves, yep. isn't it? Yep. They do have some form of immunity, but if the cell cultures get infected, then the cells all die straight away. We use antibiotics to try and protect the cells, but um, keeping infection out is absolutely essential. Yeah, and so it was. So really, then I was thinking about ways that could present some of these sort of qualities, and this whole idea that it's a very sort of ephemeral, strange life that they lead in this this three week long existence. So this was where when I what I did was I took the materials that had that were existing there, which was things like the it was the um, actual scan, the digital versions of the objects and the speech synthesis, and then it added added to them with digitised versions of the lab itself. So that included using, and so that's evolved into the film and an immersive piece, which in the Summer Hall exhibition is the Augmented Reality app, which is just for iPhones, but it's downloadable. <laughs> and um, so that was made using, adding to the existing materials by doing LIDAR scans of the lab environment, which LIDAR scans being a laser technology, which mm -hmm. then gives you a point cloud version of the lab. So again, it's a very ephemeral, it's a very, very exact process as all the microscopy processes are. I mean, with their own artifacts, which is then, you know, there's all sorts of artifacts that they bring, but they're very exact as well. And it's the same with LIDAR, which it's another form of digitally capturing, but it's not photorealistic. And that was a real sort of aim for me that it wasn't just actually about a photo real version of the lab for people to enter it was to try and sort of enhance that um very um disembodied quality that it's quite thoughtful isn't it yeah. thought provoking well yeah. that's hopefully what it yeah, yeah. brings for people and then on the soundtrack side of things as well was it's added to by an electromagnetic scanned version which was developed by sound designer zoe irvin so that's again bringing it's all mediated versions of the environment that are digitally mediated and have these sort of slightly other qualities. Again, going back to the otherness that I found in the cells themselves. Mm. So that's what's then going to be presented as the projection and the app as part of the exhibition. And then um, it was then to sort of say as well, mm. the other things that are going to be exhibited alongside are some of the things we've got here as well, which 
some of the things which I was really interested as well around the collection that you've got. Now having moved to the University of Edinburgh from the University of Dundee, and we've looked in your library collection there, haven't we, and found some quite extraordinary things. Which... Historical dermatology, yeah. yeah. Historical dermatology blows my mind. It really is, to me, it's amazing how, how carefully people observed skin back through the ages. And, and that's really how medics learned about skin, by often by representing it through very detailed drawings. So, yeah, a couple of the drawings that we've brought along are, are really ancient. Was it 18? 1860 to 1888. This is from the Atlas of Skin Diseases, isn't it? That was, And so this is an eczema patient from that period where, and also you see, I mean, I was really, I'd seen these before, mm. um, but never in the first hand edition of it. Yeah. Chromatypes, I think they're called the prints. But it's, um, it was for me, I'm, I find these fascinating as the, again, going back to that idea of the lived experience of things that actually there's, and there's, we've talked about a lot in terms of science development and you working very closely with patients as well. You're very aware of the lived experience of that, but also there's a sort of, um, it can be quite paradoxical with sometimes the way that research appears to go that actually, you know, and I think that's what's very special about what your position where you're both a consultant doing work with patients and you work in a lab environment. So you have that complete connection between the lived experience so, I mean, I think that's a really special situation. That's why I do research, because you meet patients that really suffer. So then you have to, well, for me, it's a compulsion to try and understand their skin disease better. But yeah, the historical stuff, I mean, when you look back at it, these are very, they are very emotive. I find, you know, you look into her eyes and she, you can see the suffering. Um, and, and nowadays, there's still stigma around skin conditions. You know, my patients still suffer misunderstanding and misconceptions because they have skin problems. And sometimes people feel embarrassed or ashamed about their skin, which is something that we really, we really are able to help with. You know, we should be able to put that aside nowadays with the better treatments that we have. But still, you know, my patients suffer and, and you can see in her eyes, she suffers. Imagine you had a skin condition like that that was so difficult to treat. This is actually infected eczema. So with uh, impetigo that we can still get nowadays, but it wouldn't get to that extent. Um, so, yeah, the, the historical perspective in some ways shows how far we've moved forwards, but in other ways emphasises how good the, the physicians were there and, and how much we still have to learn even now. Um, and the craft of the documentation in that as well, I think, is that what I'm really, really interested in as well as how, the, and, and how it actually, as opposed to a lot of dermatology images that you might see now, which actually might be a lot of the time anonymised, yeah. whereas that is completely unanonymised in that way. Yeah. And so actually it's very much putting you into the perspective of that lived experience of that person as well. So I think that's what I found really fascinating as well as the craft. Yeah. And then you were just going to say as well about this, there's another piece where, which the, these are all part of the exhibition as well, aren't they? But it's an mm -hmm. early one. That's from 1905 that has then, that is looking on a cellular level as well, which yeah. is... Which is fascinating. I mean, one of the reasons why I took it out, and I think why you were interested as well, was how long, and actually really recognising that mm -hmm. this has been for a long time that people have been looking at this in this very detailed way, yep. which then your work, which we've got a slide of here, which will be in the exhibition as well, is really at the pinnacle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to say we're at the pinnacle of research. We use genetic techniques and molecular analysis of skin, but still a lot of it comes down to actually looking at the skin down the microscope and seeing what it looks like. So that's what was being done in 1905 and that's what we still do nowadays. And again, this is, this is a slide from a scientific talk that you know is totally up to date. It's a, a talk that I gave recently showing um, the organotypic culture. This is the artificial skin that we grow and comparing it to, to normal human skin, showing that the structures are, are similar, that we can, the artificial skin does truly form a good model of the of the normal human skin. So, you know, in some ways we're very clever now, we can use molecular analysis, but in other ways, you know, carefully observing human beings and looking at skin down the microscope is still very fundamental to understanding what causes disease at the at the deepest at the deepest level. And I think this is one of the things that was really key to me and my interest in the organotypic culture as well. And it is part of the soundtrack as well, because it was very much the explanation where you talked because for me it looks so similar to human skin that would be inside the body, 
but it's like that sort of smoothed over without fat cells, hair fibres. Yeah, so... Things. So that's... And I, and I found that really fascinating. And yeah. you can see it within the slide itself. Mm, yeah, and you can see as well, you know, what we were talking about, the differentiation, the cells at the base are quite plump. And then as they, as they move up, they become more differentiated and become flatter. And this is where the three weeks comes from. Do you know that the time course that the, the skin cell tells the story, um, it takes a full three weeks from extracting the, the skin from human tissue to recreate in the organotypic culture takes three weeks and then you know in theory we could keep keep them alive for longer but after that time they start to uh, become less good in terms of structure and function so at around three weeks we we destroy them because they've been incredibly valuable the images live on but the the living tissue begins to degrade so so it gets destroyed <laughs> it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. And I guess it's that thing as well of really acknowledging then as well, isn't it, the, the donors as well in that situation. Mm -hmm, I mean, how mm -hmm. valuable they are to you as well, isn't it? It is literally gold dust. You know, we couldn't do, we, we can't do human research without human beings agreeing to contribute. And patients do that and people undergoing surgery that don't even have skin problems do that as well. And it is invaluable and every respect and gratitude to them. Well, it was a real privilege working in the the lab and really having and I think you know managing to be able to build this situation working really closely together as an artist working this closely with the scientists so thank you for that.